In part 8, we're going to talk about scene intersection shaders. What do I mean by that? Well, sometimes you want the appearance of your object to change when it physically intersects another object. In fact, here's three examples of that. The first is adding some ambient occlusion around the edges of an object. The second is making the edges of the object glow. And the third is adding foam to the parts of a water mesh that intersect the coast and other objects in the water. Let's start with the occlusion effect. We talked about ambient occlusion in part 6, and to recap, it's the phenomenon where light can't reach crevices on an object's surface, so in lit shaders, we can use the texture to make those bits darker. Ambient occlusion also appears in real life when you have two objects placed close together. You'll see shadows around the intersection. That's what I'm going to recreate with this shader, and here's a super simple test scene with a plane and a sphere mesh which would use the shader. We can manually simulate occlusion in an unlit shader, kind of like how we explored custom lighting in part 7, so I'm going to create an unlit shader for simplicity via create, shader graph, URP, unlit shader graph, and name it intersection occlusion. As with a lot of these graphs, I'll start off with base colour and base texture properties wired up like this. Then we can work on adding the occlusion. But first, let's break down how we're going to detect the intersections. When a shader is running, it only has direct access to information about the pixel currently being rendered, including its position in world space. We want to compare that position to the position of the next object rendered behind it, and if the distance between the two points is smaller than a threshold we specify, then we have detected an intersection. The only way we're going to get information about another object is indirectly through the depth buffer, which we covered in part 4. That does immediately throw a couple of limitations into the mix. First, our intersection shader must be transparent, because Unity only saves the state of the depth buffer into the depth texture, after rendering all opaques, and before rendering all transparents. Second, our shader will not be able to detect intersections between any two transparent objects, for that same reason. Let's jump into Shader Graph and try a couple things out then. When I went into making this tutorial, I was so excited to try out the new Scene Depth Difference node, which is meant to make all of this easy. But I'm gonna level with you, I have no idea what the heck this node is doing. Look what you get when you set the node to eye mode, I can't even conceive what eldritch horrors are going on behind the scenes here. The other modes require a lot of additional nodes to get working too, so instead we're gonna use the old fashioned method. First, we'll add a scene depth node to get the distance between the camera and whatever object was previously rendered at this pixel. If you recall from part 4, which was all about the depth buffer, we can use eye mode to get precisely this distance. Then we need to get the distance between the camera and the object we are currently rendering. Explaining how to get that value is a little technical, but I'm going to give you a full rundown for the sake of clarity and completeness, so bear with me. You don't need to understand every detail here, but I don't want to just pull a bunch of nodes from thin air, so here we go. In part 5, I talked about how the graphics pipeline turns abstract mesh data into stuff on your screen. Well, near the end of the pipeline, the vertices of your mesh are defined in clip space, which is a representation of your mesh relative to the camera, including its near and far clip planes and its field of view. Everything is either inside or outside the camera's visible bounding box. Clip space, as the name suggests, makes it easy for Unity to clip, or in other words, remove, objects that won't be visible, since they're outside the box. Unity then gets some clip space to screen space by accounting for the camera's perspective, which happens automatically after the vertex stage, even if you're writing a code-based shader. That's the bit I didn't mention in part 5. The key thing about clip space is that it uses a 4D vector to represent your 3D vertex positions, and I'll leave a pinned comment and a bonus little Patreon video to explain why that's the case, because that is getting far too into the weeds for this tutorial, but the useful thing for us is that the fourth component of that vector is equal to the distance between the camera 
and the vertex being rendered. Hey, that's just what we wanted. In Shader Graph, we can access this value using a screen position node with its mode set to raw. Despite the name of the node, raw mode gets us the clip space positions rather than the screen space positions. We can grab the fourth component of the vector using a split node. So here we have the two distances we needed, and we can get the difference between them by subtracting one from the other. Now this is all great, but this is a collection of nodes that I think I will need to use more than once. We can, of course, just copy and paste these nodes into other shaders as and when we need them, but there's a more elegant way of reusing nodes by using subgraphs. A subgraph is like a function that we can insert into full graphs to act like a single node. To create a subgraph, let's left click and drag around these four nodes, then right click and choose convert to subgraph. We can save it wherever we want. I'm going to call it depth intersection. And then we can double click the new subgraph in the project view to open it in a new shader graph editor window. With a subgraph, we need to define the inputs and outputs however we want. This particular subgraph doesn't need inputs, but we could add those the same way we add properties to a regular graph. For the outputs, we can click the output node that should be somewhere on the subgraph and go over to the node settings. Here we can add new outputs to the list using the plus arrow. The only output from this subgraph will be the distance value representing the intersection length, so I'll add a float output, which I can rename by double clicking the name field. Following the convention of most of Unity's built in nodes, I'll just name it out. Finally, we can connect the subtract node to the output node. Let's hit save at it and return to our main intersection occlusion graph. We now have a way of detecting intersections, although, as I mentioned, this will only work in transparent graphs. So let's go to the graph settings and make sure the surface is set to transparent. If we output the intersection values to base color, the sphere mesh would look like this, with black around the edges and white where there's no intersection. Instead, I want to turn this into a value where 1 represents intersections at their full strength, and it gets lower as we get further from an intersection. So we're going to use a 1 minus node for that, but now some of the values away from the intersection are going to be negative, which will mess with the next steps of the calculation. So next we'll use a saturate node, which sets negative values to become 0, and values above 1 to become 1. I'm not a fan of the name, but it's a holdover from shading languages like HLSL, and a good analogy for how it works is to think of a box with a capacity of 1. It can't be emptier than having nothing in it, and you can't overfill it, so trying to add like 1.5 means the 0.5 is just lost. Next, let's think about how to control the width of the intersections. There are lots of ways to do this, but we're currently working with values between 0 and 1, so the easiest way is probably to just raise the values to a configurable power value. Let's add a float property called intersection power, which I'm going to make a slider between 0 0.01 and 25, because a value of 0 would apply full occlusion to the entire mesh, and 25 is an arbitrary value that results in a very thin occlusion. We'll use a power node with the intersection power property, which now means the thickness of the occluded portion of the mesh can be configured. Now let's add the ability to make the occlusion lighter or darker overall by adding another float property called occlusion strength. This one can be a slider between 0 and 1. It's going to act as a global multiplier for the values we've calculated so far, so go ahead and drag the property onto the graph and multiply it with what we have so far. So far, we still have a value between 0 and occlusion strength, where 0 represents areas where we have no occlusion and 1 represents full occlusion. Because of the occlusion strength property, the values might not actually reach 1. To apply this to the base color, let's use a lerp node. In the T slot, we can plug in the value we just calculated. In the A slot, where there's no occlusion, let's plug in the base color nodes I added right at the beginning. And in the B slot, where there's full occlusion, let's add a float node and set a value of 0, which means totally black. Finally, we can output the result to the graph's base color output. 
In the scene view, we can play around with the intersection power to make the occluded sections of the object thinner or thicker, and change the occlusion strength to modify the overall strength of the occlusion effect. Note that this shader will run into problems in some scenarios, such as if you add a cube that's flush with the surface of the floor, but only juts out a tiny bit. When viewed from above, the intersection distance for all the pixels is very low, so it's going to apply occlusion to everything. I found that the effect works really well with objects like rocks, where it's pretty common to just add the mesh clipping through the floor, and then we can rely on occlusion to soften the boundary between the rocks and the floor. What we've just implemented is a very basic version of screen space ambient occlusion. More elegant solutions use step values from several pixels around the pixel being rendered in order to get a more accurate understanding of the shape of the objects around the pixel, but I wanted to show you the most basic version. If you're interested in going deeper, look into other SSAO techniques. That said, SSAO is usually implemented as a post-processing effect, so it might be a bit more complicated to create your own version, at least in URP. This part is getting pretty long, but I still want to show you the other two effects from the start of this video, namely the edge glow and the water foam shaders. So the next part of this series will cover those two effects. Until next time, have fun making shaders.